This is my update for Russian military operations in Ukraine for September 12th, 2022. And I'm doing these updates in quick succession because there is a lot taking place in Ukraine right now. Usually I would do about one or two updates a week, if even, but obviously there's been a lot of activity. And as I like to do, let's go to the map. Remember, this is a pro-Ukrainian map, liveuamap.com. It is essentially the visualization of reports coming in from Ukraine general staff, the Ukrainian government, and uh, Western official sources. So as we can see here, uh, there were there was an offensive, and it was launched in at least two places, rumors circulating that there's a concentration of Ukrainian forces in several other areas ahead of what may be uh, an offensive. But as you can see, Kherson, this was where the first push was made virtually no territorial changes. It has ground to a halt and at great cost. And I'm going to get into that again uh, in this update. If we go up to the northeast, Kharkov Oblast, you can see that Russia has withdrawn from the entire oblast. And it's important to point out that Russia withdrew from this oblast. They did not stand in f and fight and die on the battlefield. And that is how Ukraine took back Kharkov Oblast. Now, it's obviously a tactical victory for Ukraine. They organized this offensive and they created a threat significant enough to force Russia to withdraw. However, this comes at great cost. And I'm going to get into the cost here in just a moment. It is possible to have a tactical success and still face strategic defeat. And as a matter of fact, it's possible that some of your tactical successes uh, contribute to a very significant strategic defeat. And I'm going to get into all of that. Now, it's very clear, if you've been following this closely, that Russia made very, very little effort trying to hold Kharkov. When they saw the scale of the offensive, considering the lack of defenses, that Russia had prepared. They made the decision, the right decision from a, a military point of view to simply withdraw the forces. This was not a pre-planned withdrawal. Okay, people who are claiming that it was, I don't think that it was, uh, but it was a conscious decision to withdraw forces and they did it as orderly as possible. And uh, we're seeing reports coming in of uh, equipment taken, prisoners being taken, uh, Russian losses, but of course they are a fraction of what they would be if Russia stood and fought. And that is the entire point of withdrawing, is to conserve Russian manpower and equipment uh, while simultaneously taking out a huge uh, amount of Ukrainian forces and equipment. You have to remember that Russia has been going slowly and methodically over the battlefield, inching across the Donbas region and elsewhere, specifically because Ukraine has formidable defenses. It takes a long time to weaken them enough to be able to storm them and take them. Uh, but when Ukraine launches an offensive, all of these forces come out from behind their defenses and they're out in the open. And it, it turned the Kharkov region into a shooting gallery. Ukraine has uh, conservatively speaking here, lost between two to three brigades worth of men and machines. Uh, and that follows the Kherson offensive, where they lost between three and five brigades, at least, of men and equipment. Now, uh, uh, real quick, a real quick note here. A lot of people in the comment section are, are going to say this is coping. Uh, what I'm about to explain is coping. And in previous videos, they've been saying this. But in actuality, if you have this you know, successful offensive, you, you've taken all of this territory, but it doesn't fundamentally change any of the things that have been causing you to lose all along. And as a matter of fact, the whole reason you're so excited is because for months and months you have been losing. It's actually you who are coping. You're not admitting that despite the tactical success here, strategically you are still at a huge disadvantage, and this tactical success does not lead anywhere logically toward victory. It does not. Back to Kharkov. Now, the, the lines have stabilized 
along the Donbas region. Uh, Ukraine has attempted to launch several offensives into the Donbas region, uh, uh, areas that are held by Russia and the uh, Republic militias, and they have failed. They have all failed. Uh, so it looks like Ukraine has reached the very limit of this particular offensive. And this is what I said in my previous updates, that they are going to push to the fullest extent, they're going to grind to a halt, and then we have to wait and see what what Russia is going to do in response to this. Now, I want to I want to elaborate a little bit more on the cost because I I see a lot of people are confused uh, as to you know what actually happened around Kherson and what is now happening around uh, Kharkov Kharkov Oblast. Now, this is a Washington Post article. Wounded Ukrainian soldiers reveal steep toll of Kherson offensive. It's not just the Russian Ministry of Defense saying Ukraine paid a steep toll for a failed offensive. The Washington Post, which is extremely pro-Ukrainian and is part of the Western propaganda campaign backing Ukraine, this is what they are admitting. This is just what they are admitting. What does the Washington Post say? And I've reported on this before, but I think it's worth repeating. The soldiers say they lacked the artillery needed to dislodge Russia's entrenched forces and described a yawning technology gap with their better equipped adversaries. It also says that we lost five people for every one they did, said Ihor, a 30-year-old platoon commander who injured his back when the tank he was riding in crashed into a ditch. It also says Russia's Orlan drones exposed Ukrainian positions from more than a kilometer above their heads, they said, an altitude that meant they never heard the buzz of the aircraft tracking their movements. Russian tanks emerged from newly built cement fortifications to blast infantry with large caliber artillery, the wounded Ukrainian soldiers said. The vehicles would then shrink back beneath the concrete shelters, shielded from mortar and rocket fire. Counter-battery radar systems automatically detected and located Ukrainians who were targeting the Russians with projectiles, unleashing a barrage of artillery fire in response. Russian hacking tools hijacked the drones of Ukrainian operators who saw their aircraft drift away helplessly behind enemy lines. It also says Ukrainian soldiers said they had to carefully ration their use of munitions. But even when they did fire, they had trouble hitting targets. When you give the coordinates, it's supposed to be accurate, but it is not, he said, noting that his equipment dated back to 1989. Uh, the Washington Post also says Russian electronic warfare also posed a constant threat. Soldiers described ending their shifts and turning on their phones to call or text family members, a decision that immediately drew Russian artillery fire. And when we turn on mobile phones or radio, they can recognize our presence immediately. And then the shooting starts. Does that, does that sound like Ukraine enjoyed any type of success around Kherson? No. And the only reason they enjoyed any sort of success around Kharkov is because Russian forces uh, were unprepared and they consciously decided not to fight for Kharkov. That is why Ukraine succeeded. If Russia prepared uh, equal or greater defenses around Kharkov, then the same exact process would have unfolded. Now, here is where Russia's shortcomings are revealed. Russia definitely has shortcomings. It is not all powerful. And because they have decided to uh, conduct this military operation as a special military operation, this is not a euphemism for total war. Russia is not waging total war against Ukraine. They are uh, several steps short of total war. They have not conducted any sort of massive mobilization of manpower within Russia. They're using uh, exclusively contract soldiers they have not even mobilized their existing reserve. They are not tapping into the total summation of Russian military equipment. They are conserving all of this uh, militarily and politically. They still have this as an option to fall back on. But because it's a special military operation and manpower is limited, especially infantry, they they have to make choices of what they decide to hold on to and what they decide not to. The three objectives of Russia's special military operation in Ukraine is to demilitarize Ukraine, denazify Ukraine, and to defend the, the Donbas region. Uh, so being in Kharkov 
does not necessarily serve the pursuit of any of these objectives. Uh, withdrawing, when, when you face a significant offensive and you are unprepared to defend against it, withdrawing is militarily the smart decision. Now, politically, I will, I will talk about that a little bit later, but militarily, that's what you do. And that is a limita uh, limitation imposed on Russia by itself because they are conducting this as a special military operation. Now, to prove that a special military operation is not a euphemism for all-out war, we just received a practical demonstration of this. Uh, last night, my, my last night, I'm um, uh, plus seven GMT, uh, Russia conducted missile strikes all across Ukraine. And what they decided to do for the first time after six to seven months is to target critical infrastructure all across Ukraine. That means communication towers and power plants. And they plunged Ukraine into blackouts all across the country. Uh, some of this can be fixed very quickly. Some of this cannot. And if Russia decides to continue doing this, this is going to have a very serious impact on Ukraine's combat power. The Guardian, in one of its live blogs, it discusses this attack on uh, Ukrainian infrastructure. It says, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has accused Russia of terrorist attacks on infrastructure targets in Kharkiv, the country's second city. The attacks came hours after Ukrainian forces reclaimed thousands of square miles of territory east of the city as Russian forces abandoned their positions in the face of a counteroffensive. And this, this is the Western media confirming that Russia chose not to fight. They left. They did not fight and were destroyed. And this is how Ukraine got this territory back. They made the choice to withdraw. Zelensky said in a message on Telegram on Sunday night that Ukraine and the civilized world clearly see these terrorist acts and that Russia was trying to deprive his people of gas, light, water, and food. He added that Ukraine would prevail and appeared to address the Russian leadership saying, do you still think that you can scare us? And it's, it's not about scaring Ukrainians. It's about further hindering their ability to conduct combat. And that is exactly what's going to happen here. Just one example. Now you have blackouts across Ukraine. You're going to need diesel fuel for generators to keep essential buildings running, essential infrastructure running, which means less diesel for the front line. That is just one example out of many. When you look at these uh, offensives, counter offensives conducted by Ukraine, you have to look past these very superficial conclusions that people are drawing. Oh, you know, Ukraine is taking more territory in a couple of days than Russia has in a couple of months. But again, at what, at what cost? Russia is fundamentally stronger than Ukraine. It has a, a bigger country in terms of landmass. It has a bigger population. It has a bigger economy. Its economy is much more stable than both Ukraine and uh, many of its Western sponsors. It has a larger military and it enjoys uh, advantages in terms of technology. Uh, all of these things that the Washington Post just described in relation to the failed Kherson offensive. When you look at the fundamentals, you can see that Ukraine is paying a, a disproportionate price uh, for this gain, this gain in the Kharkov region. Uh, they, they have lost entire brigades. So uh, the price for around Kherson was about three to five brigades. A brigade is about 4,000 4, men strong. So between three to five brigades. And we're talking about dead and wounded. Wounded meaning you sustained serious uh, injuries that are going to keep you off the battlefield for the, uh, you know, foreseeable future. Uh, then around Kharkov, it's at least another two or three brigades. And uh, when you add to that the fact that in terms of deaths, Ukraine is losing between one and two brigades per month just through normal fighting. Uh, and then another three to six brigades in terms of wounded. You're, you're talking about a huge amount of Ukraine's trained manpower disappearing off the battlefield, and it is incredibly difficult to get it back. As a matter of fact, that these losses, and these numbers are based on numbers Ukraine, uh, Kiev has claimed, their, their daily losses throughout this fighting.
So to put all of that in perspective, uh, we've got this from the Atlantic Council, which is essentially NATO's propaganda arm. The Ukrainian military must reorganize to defeat Russia. And it says Ukraine began the war, and they're talking about uh, February 2022, with some 38 maneuver infantry and tank brigades and nine artillery brigades organized on the Russian model. Each brigade numbers around 4,000 soldiers commanded by a colonel. Uh, so let's let's be conservative with our numbers. Let's let's also give Ukraine benefit of the doubt and say that all of their brigades were up to full strength, which probably they weren't. Uh, Ukraine has lost three brigades every month. Uh, this is again based on casualty numbers provided by Kiev itself. Uh, they have lost at least three brigades worth of men for seven months. So that's 21 brigades gone. Uh, plus now four around Kherson, again, being conservative, and another two around Kharkov. Uh, so that is a total of 27 brigades worth of men and equipment gone. When you add all of that up, that is 71% of what Ukraine began with in February 2022, according to the Atlantic Council. Uh, that is 71% of their maneuver and tank brigades. Uh, these are catastrophic losses that Ukraine cannot sustain. They have no ability whatsoever to uh, keep pace with these losses. That means uh, re you know, reconstituting these brigades, training men who can conduct combat operations effectively on the battlefield. They cannot. There's absolutely no way they can do this. Now, to be fair, not all of Ukraine's losses on the battlefield are coming from these brigades. A lot of it is from territorial defense and other units that are thrown into the mix. Uh, but even if you were to cut that, that number 71% in half, it is still a catastrophic loss that they cannot sustain. They are not sustaining it. You can see that they aren't. And if you take all of these losses, especially now with these two very expensive offensives, Ukraine lost one, which completely failed around Kherson. Another, which it's a success in the, in, the, in the sense that they took this territory, but it is a failure in the sense that they, they did not eliminate the Russian forces that were there. They simply pushed them out. Uh, now, Ukraine, with its very limited dwindling manpower, they have all of this extra territory they now have to hold. It also means that their strained logistics lines have to move that much further and that much more equipment that much further. This is this is something that even in the very near, near term is going to strain them strategically. A tactical success contributing directly to strategic failure. And here is where I want to talk about history a little bit. I want to look at the Ardennes Offensive. This took place in 1944. It was Germany's last ditch effort in the West, the Western Front, to carry out some sort of offensive uh, it was a massive of offensive. They threw everything they had left into it. Uh, even so, at the, at the onset of this offensive, the planners behind it knew that there was no way they were going to overpower the Allies. What they were looking for was a, a political settlement for the, the war rather than allowing it to conclude itself on the battlefield. Uh, but it didn't work that way. So on YouTube, there is a three-part documentary series. It's old, but it is really well done, incredibly insightful. And it's simply titled The Ardennes Offensive. And I will put the link to all three parts in the video description below so you can watch them. And uh, I'm going to point out a few clips just to give you an idea of what it's about. And I think you can very clearly and instantly spot the similarities between what Germany was trying to do then in 1944 and what Ukraine just did outside of Kherson and Kharkov uh, very recently. So in this uh, first clip, I'm going to show you it's it's showing you how the dire situation Germany was in, in terms of manpower and equipment and how they had to spend months preparing just to launch this offensive. And it really was absolutely everything they could muster thrown into this last offensive. In the West, the Allied armies, after breaking out of the Normandy beachhead in July, had advanced rapidly and were poised to attack into Germany. They'd come to a temporary halt, however, being still at the end of a perilously attenuated line of supply reaching right back to the channel ports. They were awaiting the opening of the port of Antwerp 
before launching a further, possibly final attack into Germany. This was the situation that faced Hitler when he considered and planned his audacious counterattack. He assessed the military and political situation facing the Third Reich. He realized that a German victory against such odds was highly unlikely. But he also believed that there was a great deal of dislike and distrust between the Allies. If one single offensive could be mounted that would drive a wedge between them, their fragile relationship would collapse. With this situation, Hitler felt that he could avoid the demand for unconditional surrender, negotiate separate peace treaties with the Western Allies, and so gain time to fight the Russians in the East. He concluded that his best chance of success lay in the West, and in mid-August gave the order to prepare to take the offensive in November when the enemy air force cannot operate. He insisted that 25 divisions had to be moved to the West in the next one or two months. His generals could hardly take in an order of this nature, as almost all of the German army in the West had been destroyed after the fighting in Normandy and the subsequent retreat from France. These enormous losses in arms, ammunition and manpower would have to be made good, and the Eastern Front too was desperately in need of more men and equipment. But those um, divisions were built up, the so-called uh, Volksgrenadier Division and People's um, Guards uh, Divisions, and um, he, um, but they were, they were trained in a very short time, and I think they were not as good as they would have been if, um, if they would have been a longer training. Now, when the offensive began, German soldiers were on this emotional high. They honestly thought that this was, this was a turning point and that not only was the offensive going to be successful, but it, it could win them the war. They honestly thought this. So, so listen to this clip from this documentary. We had heard before that uh, the, our recon battalion had managed to capture approximately uh, 60 American trucks full of supplies and our soldiers were living like God in France. And we were full of joy when we uh, went here. There was practically no resistance at all and we were singing and uh, thinking that uh, there were, would be a chance to win the war. Now, ultimately, uh, the offensive didn't just fail, but it contributed directly to Germany's overall defeat. And listen to how this documentary concludes. By the end of January, the Germans were back to where they'd launched the attack six weeks earlier. And it was only a matter of time before the Allied counterattack would force them back into Germany. The utter failure of Hitler's great offensive had left Germany at the mercy of her attackers. Was Hitler's decision to hazard all on a surprise attack against a fundamentally stronger opponent justified? Did Germany gain any advantage by her costly sacrifice? The Battle of Ardennes had no advantage for Germany. The final result of the lost war uh, was the same if we had begun this battle or not that it deprived Germany of all operational reserves. We had not enough forces, not enough strength, not enough uh, possibilities at all. Even if we would have won this battle of the Ardennes, then uh, after uh, two or three months, it would have turned out that it was for nothing. Not only was it a failure, but when you look at it in hindsight, you can see that it did absolutely nothing to address the fundamental deficiencies Germany had that was causing it to lose in the first place. That is exactly what we just watched Ukraine do outside of Kherson and in Kharkov. They launched these two offensives, burning through the very last of their reserves. And for what? Did any of this change fundamentally what is going on on the battlefield? Did any of this change fundamentally what is going on in Russia or in terms of Russian military power in Ukraine? You cannot do a literal comparison between the Ardennes Offensive, also known as the Battle of the Bulge, and these current offensives Ukraine has launched. But you can definitely see the themes, the similar themes playing out uh, between these two points in history. Finally, let's talk about the political price Russia is paying for giving up Kharkov. Uh, every Russian-speaking Ukrainian in Kharkov uh, who was, you know, working with the Russians or welcoming the Russians or 
uh, are tolerating their presence there in Kharkov, they're going to be harassed or imprisoned or tortured or murdered. And we've seen this play out over and over again all, all throughout this conflict. That is what's going to happen to the, the people left behind in Kharkov. And there's no easy way to get around that. That is what's happening right now. Uh, but I want to point something else out. Since 2014, since the U.S. overthrew the elected government of Ukraine, the resulting regime installed into power uh, from that point onward has terrorized uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainians all over Ukraine. didn't matter whether they were in the Donbas region, uh, in Kharkov, Oblast, or anywhere else in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has been sponsoring terrorism in Crimea. They killed Daria Dugina right outside of Moscow. Uh, Ukraine, the regime in Kiev right now, poses a threat to everyone, everywhere, not just in the Donbas region, not just in Kharkov, not just in areas uh, the regime in Kiev administers right now. The whole purpose of Russia's military operation in Ukraine in the first place is to deal with the threat the client regime in Kiev poses, not just to the, the people in Ukraine or in the Donbas, but also everyone in Russia. It's not just the, the threat that the regime in Kiev poses directly to Russians, but also the, the implications of NATO expanding itself by proxy right up to Russia's border. That said, there may be some calculation that was done uh, that goes something like this. They understand that the people in Kharkov are going to suffer tremendously, but because Ukraine has overextended what's left of its reserves, what's left of its forces, uh, and they are take, taking serious losses right now, and now they are incredibly vulnerable, and they are, they are much more spread out, and they are much more vulnerable than they had been, uh, if this hastens the end of this conflict overall, then maybe this, uh, re uh, relatively speaking, short-term suffering might, might somehow be worth it. Uh, that is something that we won't know. Only time can tell. Uh, we saw a, a very similar situation unfold in Syria. From 2015 onward, Russia made a lot of difficult decisions, a lot of policies that at the time frustrated absolutely everyone. Uh, people wondering why they aren't being more forceful and doing things quicker. But when you look in hindsight, you realize that if they didn't do it that way, it, it could have actually created a much worse situation uh, that would be much further from peace and stability than Syria is now. And Syria is by no means uh, <laughs> out of the woods yet, but they are in a much better position than when they were in 2015, that is for sure. Now, one, one last thing I want to address. A, a lot of people are saying, well, Brian, you're, you're very critical of Ukraine and how they are fighting this, and you're, you're pointing out the futility of this fighting. Uh, but what should they do? Should they just give up their sovereignty to Russia? Or, you know, Russia invaded them. Why aren't they allowed to fight back? Ukraine already gave up its sovereignty back in 2014 when the U.S. overthrew their elected government, a, a government that was far from perfect, but a government that was maintaining a balance between its relationship with Russia and its relationship with the West and getting the best out of both worlds. Today, from 2014 to today, uh, they were forced to pick a side. The client regime installed into power allowed for nothing else. And by doing so, they have destroyed their economy. They have divided their population into what you could call a civil war. And they have been uh, hurtling towards this cliff uh, of self-destruction the entire time. Uh, they already lost their sovereignty. They cannot get it back by fighting Russia. They need to get it back from those who took it in the first place. Washington, London, and Brussels. So that does it for this particular update. I'll keep an eye on things. If uh, anything of strategic importance unfolds, I will do another update. If you thought this was interesting, please like and share. Think about subscribing to my channel. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. And if you're watching this on YouTube, check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. I'm on Telegram, Odyssey, and Rumble. Also in the video description below are all of the links that I referenced, including the three-part documentary about the Ardennes Offensive. I highly recommend watching it. Uh, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to 
repeat it. And that is what we're watching in Ukraine right now, history repeating itself. Also in the video description below are ways you can help support my work. You can do that through buy me a coffee, through Patreon, and also PayPal to everyone who has been contributing month to month or through one-time donations. Thank you so much. That is what allows me to continue doing this work. Uh, so thank you again. And as always, thank you for watching.